This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is officially March, which means it is time to turn the calendar and talk some men's college basketball, which meant we had to bring back Dr. Ed Fang, bring him back from vacation, get him back here on the show to ramp things up as we get set for the tournament, for conference tournaments, and so much more. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as mentioned by Dr. Ed thing find his work over at the power rank.com you can find him on twitter at the power rank ed it has been a while because you've been on vacation i yeah. uh, had to get some data caught up and all that stuff you had a power outage so i am ecstatic to have you back for today it is a pleasure to have you on how you doing thanks for having me jim i am doing about as well as possible given that i haven't had power for the last six days it switched on this morning and life is just so easy when you have power everywhere. <laughs> I kind of feel like I want to turn off like half my circuit breaker. Yeah. You know, give myself a little bit of a challenge. We are Americans. We try to do hard things. But all things considered, uh, I'm obviously not in my usual spot because even though I have power in my house. Yeah. I do not have the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy came and attached things yesterday and we were so excited. And then it didn't work. Yeah. So, so for the for the quality of the show, uh, I'm I'm at a friend's house, hence this Christmas tree behind us, and like everything's kind of like, you know, just not quite right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm leaving again tomorrow for Boston. You know, we're doing the show, and Jim hasn't like fixed my like Twitter tag. Like in oh, the yeah. show, it's not like the I've right gotten format, super lax you know? about that. I no longer care. I've decided. Oh um, really? Oh yeah. Okay. So that's what I, I know. I actually was very like I just threw it in there because I because I knew you'd <laughs> fix it. So. I could fix it now, uh, but no, 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 no. Yeah, we're going to just the power rank as your Twitter <laughs> handle uh, down there. But have you considered? I know you're a runner. Have you considered, you know, like running to generate power for your house? Have you thought yeah, about that? Maybe because you could go for a while, man. For sure, I think you run to stay warm. Yeah. Okay. When your house is 50 degrees, then you're okay. Yeah. But uh, not not much to generate power. Uh, I also believe not to like deter people from coming on the show, but I think it might be a curse because you had the power outage for the past six days. We had Pamela Maldonado on uh, a couple weeks ago, right before Austin had their, or right after Austin had their big power outage. So mm -hmm. it's possible there's a correlation like correlation is not causation. However, not I'm causation. concerned. I'm concerned Ed, that maybe there is a trend here that I've I developed with killing people's power. Did they have another power outage in Austin this winter? Yeah, real bad. It was, I think it was when you were gone. Uh, yeah, because it was right. before Super Bowl. Um, and mm. we had Pamela on. It was like a couple day thing. So that was pretty bad. She was still nice enough to like, you know, come on the show and talk to us. But like, that was bad. You've had six days, which is brutal too. And I didn't even know that was happening. Um, so that's rough too. But the reason you didn't hear about it is because you were, uh, you were abroad. Uh, for yep. vacation back uh, for the past month. So how did things go uh, for the vacation? It was awesome. We had it, hadn't traveled overseas since the pandemic. And so mm -hmm. it was really nice to get over to Barcelona, eat some really good food. Barcelona is pretty interesting because the touristy stuff is actually pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. Sagrada Familia is, is kind of mind blowing when you actually see it. It is the most touristy thing that you can do there, but you, you can't miss it. It's, it's kind of mind blowing. Uh, we also, uh, the food is fantastic. And we also did a really cool Spanish Civil War tour. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, which was mostly fantastic because of the guy that was doing it. Uh, he yeah. did a really good job with it. So overall, it was great. It was great to get over there and uh, just, just kind of get away. And, and um, you know, I was still working, you know, doing doing some stuff with Super Bowl props, which was, which was also kind of fun. Um, but overall, great trip. Yeah, we before we went to Barcelona, I was never a big tapas guy, but since we came back, I've been like big into tapas. Uh, mm -hmm. I've realized that it's just it's the right way to live. Um, <laughs> you get to sample a lot of stuff. You get to have different tastes and stuff like that. So I've been fully converted into team tapas um, via Barcelona. I think that's the right way to go. I think tapas are great. I think there's a huge variety of tapas. We tried a bunch of places. You know, one thing you can get there is a croquette. Jim, I finally yeah. remember the name, like croquette. <laughs> they do, most places will do a great croquette. 
It's mm. almost like they like teach people how to deep fry. Like if you move into the city, <laughs> everyone does a fantastic job. But you know, like uh, like the best tapas place we find like we ended up going to ended up being one that we walked by like maybe a hundred times uh, before we finally decided to stop in. Um, so uh, I would suggest really kind of doing your homework and, and figuring yeah. out like the places that are, that are particularly good. Um, did you do the vermouth thing when you were over there? Yes. Um, is, are you talking about like the, the, the Spanish specific vermouth? They have Spanish specific vermouths, but just the whole notion that like a cot, like, your happy hour kind of drink is vermouth on ice with a, a wedge of orange. Yes. Um, so we actually, um, we went to uh, uh, Montserrat um, okay. and it, this is not, this is not vermouth, but like um, they had the, uh, what the monks up in the mountains, like made their own kind of alcohol and mm -hmm. we tried to like find it at the airport when we were leaving. So like we at the duty free shop, we're like, we need to get the stuff before we leave and couldn't find it there. And it's like one of my biggest regrets is not finding that. Uh, so we did do the vermouth though. Um, and it was pretty great. Uh, other thing that, that I picked up was um, making espresso a thing. <laughs> I had one earlier today. I've become like mildly addicted to espresso. So I picked up, I would say good habits from, international travel people who hear me talk too fast may disagree with that notion that it's a good <laughs> habit um again correlation is not causation but yeah. maybe um so yes uh, i'm i'm pro all of these things personally awesome well before i get uh, too nostalgic about traveling uh we got to talk about some men's college basketball we're talk about just kind of data you can use to pinpoint regression, progression, stuff like that. For those of you who may be checking out men's college basketball for the first time this year, if you're diving back in, we're going to kind of get Ed's guidelines, what to look for when trying to bet on teams and try to pinpoint teams that could make steps forward, take steps back, as we get said, for the conference tournaments. But before we do that, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread. Wherever you get your podcast, we have got men's college basketball, PGA, NBA, NHL, NASCAR, and Formula One tomorrow, all in the same place. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcast, and check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page as well. FanDuel is America's number one sports book and the number one place to get your friends into the game. That's why FanDuel is giving you and a friend the opportunity to each earn $75. All you need is to invite your friends using your exclusive referral link under the refer icon in the app. As soon as your friend makes any bet of at least $10 on Sportsbook, you'll both get $50 in Sportsbook bonus bets. And as soon as they bet at least $10 on FanDuel Casino, you'll both get $25 in casino credit. Just head over to the FanDuel Sportsbook and Casino apps to invite your friends today and get your $75 referral bonus. Must be 21 plus and present in Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia. Referred players must wager $10 plus within 30 days after signing up. Limit five referrals during a 30 day period. Sportsbook bonus bets and casino site credit are non withdrawable and expire 14 days after receipt. Uh, restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, 1-800-GAMBLER, and in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Now, Ed has mentioned we just turned the calendar over to March, and some people may not have been paying super close attention to college basketball yet this year. Obviously, we know we can just direct them to the power rank. We can send them there, digest your numbers, do it that way. We can send them to Ken Palm, whatever it may be, to get ratings. But what data do you recommend people dig into in order to determine what to expect from a team going forward? Right. I think, you know, you really do want to start with the ratings. Mm -hmm. Ken Palm is definitely the, uh, the most well-known. He's going to take points per possession, which is your most important efficiency metric and adjust for strength of schedule and give you numbers on offense and defense. And then, and then for a team, he also has predictions. Uh, if you want a sense for how he makes those predictions, I actually have uh, an ultimate guide to college basketball analytics on my site. Uh, it's on the sidebar when, whenever you go there, you can check that out. I, I also talk about the four factors and whether matchups matter. Um, so that's a good starter guide. 
Another thing I would recommend, um, I'm actually leaving one of my men, my member of college basketball rankings page, like open to the public right oh, now. Nice. So you can see both of the models that I use. Um, I have an ELO model that, I mean, it's been within a quarter percent of the opening line. The predictions based on that has been within a quarter percent uh, in terms of uh, the error estimate. So it, it's pretty accurate. Um, I don't know if it's that more accurate than Kempom, but I, I would bet that it is uh, because of the things that I use. So, yeah, so definitely go check that out. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later today. Um, you'll also get, um, you know, my version of points per possession adjusted for opponent. So that's with my algorithms. Pretty much the same thing from what you'll get with Ken. I don't know whether he's like how much he's waiting the preseason right now. I have zero preseason prior in there. And yeah. that should be pretty good at this point in the season. Uh, so we'll talk about that as well. And then, um, you know, you know, some of my friends that bet college basketball, they've been using uh, hoop math. Apparently they have some really good stuff with uh, uh, they have some really good statistics about how teams like perform at the rim. So both on offense and on defense. And, you know, that might be something that you find useful as well. And that's a pretty good breakdown of, of stuff. So, I see that your friends have cats uh, as they friend, were popping into the screen. Um yep. Do they, I'm assuming they're exclusively power rank people, right? They are like exclusively the power rank cats for sure. Okay. They're definitely okay. looking and they were very happy that uh, I'm letting some of my member numbers uh, be open there in the public <laughs> right now. Uh, I didn't bring my mug. My mug is in the kitchen, but I have my power rank football analytics show mug out there. So we'll work on that too. Maybe we'll get the cats a mug. We can work on that yeah. and uh, get them fully integrated here. Um, but talking about the member numbers, how do those differ from the other public numbers? And what was the thought process for you behind deciding to make those member numbers public for right now? Uh, so, so there's public numbers. Yeah, that's a good point, Jim. <laughs> public numbers are pretty good. Um, they are margin of victory adjusted for strength of schedule. So this is kind of how I got into the business and it's still a very important part of what I do And the member numbers. are just more and different data sources that I use. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what makes it more accurate. I mean, there's other data sources that I found to be as, as, as accurate as what I'm doing from just the points based metrics. And so those are included in the member numbers and, um, you know, it's a very useful tool. Like you can actually just go to the ratings page, subtract the ratings of any two teams. If it's not a neutral site game at 2.9 points, those are exactly the predictions that my members are getting. Right. Interesting. Okay. So let's say someone has not paid attention yet to try to dive on in. Do you think it's a good spot to use wisdom of crowds? We talked a lot about that throughout the years, the value of sure. wisdom of crowds. There are different places you talk about uh, different free sources, especially with your member numbers being uh, public right now as well. Is that a spot where you'd want wisdom of the crowds to kind of I'm, refine things? For sure. I mean, you know, part of wisdom of crowds is what I do with member numbers. I exactly. don't just rely yeah. on points, right? So I'm combining a bunch of things. Obviously, another strategy is to take a lot of public sources and put them together. But just know that, like, you know, if you're putting Ken Palm and Bart Torvik together, that's all based on the same thing. That's all based right. on points per possession. And I'm pretty sure they both use least squares to adjust for opponent. So if you're putting those together, you know, it's probably not the hugest ensemble effect that you're going to get there. And they're probably now, also pretty heavily tied to the market, too, because people know Ken Palm and know to go there. So it, it would... Right. If you're trying to find deviations in the market and efficiency in the market, you know, that might be a tougher route as well. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that's where Ed's looking at as far as data to dive into if you're trying to get caught up with college basketball right now. So when you look at that data, Ed, you look at what's happened so far this year, are there teams that have underperformed thus far who you think could potentially improve, tick up, go on a run as we get into conference tournaments and the actual tournament itself? Absolutely. I, I think this is kind of the funnest question because I'm going to talk about Gonzaga. Gonzaga is a team that was the best team in the nation last year. Uh, I wrote about them a lot in my attorney write up. Obviously, things didn't work out as they bombed out in the Sweet 16, really didn't play their best basketball towards the tournament. Really doesn't change my opinion that they were the best team in the country. Um, and now, you know, they've really kind of struggled this season. It really hasn't been the same team at all. And it kind of says something about the Gonzaga program that, you know, they're going to be a three seed in the tournament. And it's kind of a 
almost a catastrophically bad year. So what's going on with this team? Well, they're still brilliant on offense. They have a lot of great offensive players. It starts with Drew Timmy in the post, who's still been remarkably efficient, probably even more so than last year. Julian Strother is a, is a great wing scorer. And the whole team is capable of getting to the basket and sharing the ball. So it's, it's a pretty good formula for good offense in my metrics are the best in the nation. The problem is that they stink on defense. When you look over the last two years, they've had a top five pick on that team each year. And in each of those seasons, that player was stronger on the defensive side of the ball than, than the offensive side of the ball. Jalen Suggs was a great defender, a lot of effort on that side of the ball. Chet Holmgren was like simply a shot blocking machine. They have neither of those players anymore. And, you know, the effort kind of isn't there. They really struggle to defend the dribble drive. And, you know, that it's probably going to sink them at some point when, when they get to uh, a team that's going to have a really good lead guard that can get to the basket. But with that said, you know, they can simply score. And it's not inconceivable that they can outscore six teams in a row. They're, they're that explosive. So I think it's a team that's kind of flying under the radar. If you haven't really been paying attention, you're like, yeah, Gonzaga sucks this year, which is true on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, but uh, I certainly wouldn't count them out. Do you think, I guess this might be something you've researched, uh, but I know that when looking at like NFL numbers, defense is less sticky than offense. Is that true right. in college basketball as well? Or is it is it more even between the two sides of the ball? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question, Jim. Yeah. But what I do know the answer to is that I, I did ask the question. I, I made this hypothesis, okay? If you're a bad defensive team, do you get better in the tournament simply because you play harder, right? Right. The stakes are higher. You know, everyone's watching now. All of a sudden, you put some more effort in on defense. So I looked at it. I looked at teams that are, like, not top 25 teams. How do they do in the tournament compared to what they did in the regular season? Really didn't find anything conclusive. I yeah. can't say in general that that happens. I want to say that defense is as predictive as offense, but now now yeah. that you mentioned that, I really gotta I really gotta check that in general. Yeah, interesting. Okay, um, because because well, that would be an argument is just be like, right. hey, look, you know, Gonzaga's defense is just not as predictive overall, right? And you know, college basketball has changed, right, uh, a lot. So like, what could have happened last year, maybe isn't true this year. But luckily, we have 363 college basketball teams to uh, to uh, to get some good data on that. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, Gonzaga, to win it all, is 20-1 to 1 right now. Do you think the lack of defense impacts their ceiling uh, in that regard? Again, it could, right? It yeah. kind of depends on matchups. It depends on who they end up playing. It depends on how well they play. Yeah. They're capable of playing good defense. There was a game earlier this year where they were up by a point late against BYU at BYU, and, uh, you know, they got it done. <laughs> they had a great, great defensive possession. Um, but in general, they're, they're, they're not, they're not a good defensive team. Yeah. Okay. So Gonzaga could be a team that potentially if the public is down on them based on last year's tournament showing based on perception of them this year could be a spot to buy low on them, uh, going forward. Now, what about the flip side? Some teams that may have been overperforming recently that could be due for some negative regression based on the record or based on surface level stats. So I'm going to go with Purdue here. Purdue is a team that has kind of been the college basketball darling, played really well, and they have a superstar in Zach Eady. He's a seven foot four uh, center, has taken on an additional role on the offense. Is I mean, it's just a tremendous college basketball player. But when you look at the rest of the team, I personally have a lot of questions about what's going on. And if you want a sense for that, you can just kind of look at where they were in the preseason AP poll. They were outside the top 25, and you might be saying, Ed, well, that doesn't matter. That's the preseason AP poll. But the preseason AP poll is a pretty powerful predictor of actually tournament results. So this is some work that I've done based on some insights by Ken Pomeroy and, and Nate Silver. And it's, again, this wisdom of crowd effects. So no one sports writer has a perfect poll, but you combine 60 of them together, you get a pretty good assessment of team strength. Purdue wasn't in the top 25, and I think that suggests that they're just, they're just not as talented as a team. Uh, I'm going to give Zach Eady a lot of credit. He's been incredible. But if if you're going down the stretch and you can't get him the ball for whatever reason, who's going to take the shot? 
it's probably fre freshman Fletcher lawyer. And I don't want to disparage lawyer. Cause I think he's a, he's, he's a really good player and could be potentially a fantastic player in a couple years, but he is a freshman. And so um, this is the team that I'm looking to fade. Uh, I bet Indiana plus seven and a half this past Saturday, Indiana ended up winning outright. I'm glad we got the positive variance on Indiana on Saturday because they got blown out at home last night by Iowa. So uh, obviously a little bit of good fortune there, but Purdue is definitely a team I'm looking to fade. I had Andy Molitor on my podcast last week. Mm -hmm. He also mentioned Purdue as a team that he's looking to fade. We definitely agree there. And uh, the similarity between Indiana and Purdue is neither team can hang with Northwestern. Go Cats. Uh, <laughs> just the, owning the state of Indiana and struggling elsewhere as of right now. But Purdue could be a team that Ed is looking to bet against in the near future. Okay. Let's oh, talk actually, about the before we uh yeah. before we move on. Uh I have so they play tomorrow night at Wisconsin. I have yes. Purdue winning by four. There's no okay. market out yet, but if uh yeah, but if, if Purdue opens as a five or six point favorite, I would bet Wisconsin. Okay, so check out openers. Uh, they should be up right around the time this podcast goes up. Um, so check out openers for the Thursday game, Purdue versus Wisconsin. Uh, Ed has Purdue minus four right now. So if you see a more favorable number than that, uh, could be a spot to fade Purdue in the very, very near future. Now, Purdue is one of the favorites right now to win the national championship. Uh, they have slipped a bit there. They're now down to 12 to one. Uh, Houston's a favorite at six to one. Alabama with everything going on with them is plus 750. Kansas plus 850. We've been talking, people, I talked to John Rothstein twice now about who he has at the top, and he said, I don't know. Uh, so, Ed, Thanks. when you look at your numbers, who is the best team, and do you agree with what your numbers are saying? Yeah, I mean, my numbers say Houston's the best team. Uh, my eyes agree with that as well. Kelvin Sampson is one of the best coaches in America. He gets his players to commit on the defensive side of the ball. Just just an incredible team. Um you know, my I, one of my sons is a soccer player, and I, I pull him aside when Houston's playing. I was like, just watch these guys get after it defensively. Yeah. Uh, what kind of goes under the radar is that they're also pretty good on offense. They've been a top 10 offense each of the last two years. Last year was probably a little bit more remarkable because they had injuries to Marcus Sasser and uh, Tremont Mark. Pretty sure I'm getting his name right. Um, they were still a pretty amazing team last year. They only did not make the final four because they shot one for 20 against Villanova in an elite eight game. Um, Sasser's back. Mark is back. Um, they have a really good team. And I believe they're the best team in the country. I think I bet them at eight to one to, to win it all. Uh, something that was in my newsletter in, in seven nuggets, I think a couple weeks ago. So it uh, brings joy to my heart that they, you can't get that number anymore. And uh I think Houston is a great team. I also think their example, I mean, there's, oh, um, another thing about Houston. Uh, they have a freshman, Jarris Walker, who's going to be a lottery pick. He's 6'8", a big, got a pretty decent shot, uh, very athletic, um, a, a contribute on the defensive side of the ball. So they kind of do have that, like, high upside. Mm -hmm. But, do you know, do I think Houston's unbeatable? No. I think there's a lot of parody in basketball, college basketball this year. There's no team like Gonzaga last year. There's no team like Duke in 2019 um, full of superstars that should by far away be the favorite in this tournament. Houston should be the favorite, but they kind of don't scare you like those other teams of, of the past did or at least should have in terms of how they had done over the course of the year. So I do think it's a wide open uh, year, even though I, I do think Houston should be the favorite. And it sounds like based on what you said there, that if you are looking at the market, you don't have a Houston eight to one ticket in your pocket already. Six to one is probably not a value based on what you are saying. Is that correct? I mean, maybe. Um, yeah. So th there's one other thing about Houston that I think makes them like a better shot to make it deep in the tournament. Uh, I'm saving this one for my newsletter because I think it's going to be one thing that, um yeah anyways i'm saving that one for my newsletter okay. but but there's reasons to think that they can go pretty far okay um they have the last two seasons and i find no reason to think that it won't and obviously if you have a ticket and they make the final four it's pretty easy to hedge out of it right if, if something does go wrong um so yeah i i i definitely believe in this houston team 
Okay. So Ed likes Houston and Ed uh, buying into Gonzaga, potentially fading Purdue, especially for tomorrow's game, potentially. And that's not all you'll hear from Ed Fang the next couple of weeks. We're going to have him on again next Wednesday. We'll talk about some conference tournaments then, the bigger conference tournaments. We're going to have him on for our typical NCAA tournament stream that we've done in the past eight or so years now. I don't know how long. It's been a while uh, wow. since we met at Sloan uh, a long time ago. Um, we'll yeah. have that again on the Monday. It'll be a live stream, 6 p.m. on the FanDuel YouTube page. We'll do that there. Bennett Corcoran of Shot Quality will be with us for that one as well. We'll talk about brackets, talk about all that, and then plenty more college basketball talk coming up throughout that week as well. But Ed, it was a pleasure to have you back on the show for today. I'm glad that vacation went well. I'm glad that you have power back now, despite no internet. But if people want to find the member numbers, the public numbers, the stuff you were talking about, where can they find that uh, on your site? Absolutely. Check out the powerrank.com. Sign up for the free email newsletter. Uh, kind of every week during the year, uh, I have uh, Five Nuggets Saturday, so a bunch of sports betting tips. Uh, it's gone pretty well the past couple of weeks, so definitely check that out. And then I, I'm shifting a lot of kind of my best content from the podcast to uh, the newsletter this upcoming season for for March Madness. So so definitely check it out. I mean, there will be a lot of stuff. I usually repost um, a lot of the newsletter stuff on my site. That's not going to happen for everything before the start of the tournament. So definitely check that out. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. I, I, I got a lot of stuff, fun stuff, the thing about Houston and, and there's going to be a lot of, I mean, it's going to be a really interesting tournament. I think it's more important to follow analytics than ever before, just because these teams are so close together. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think I'm going to be more valuable than, than your average tournament year. And I said this a lot, but like you've, won me my tournament pool two years and i know nothing about college awesome. basketball because i don't pay attention usually because northwestern sucks um hey they're pretty I've, good this year i've won the year. number fire pool twice in the past uh six or so years because of that so you've helped me hopefully you're helping the listeners too uh check out ed on twitter at the power rank find ed's uh ed's work at the power rank.com and he mentioned the podcast with andy molitor bet spurts that is on the football analytics show andy a great person to listen to for college basketball so check that out over there i'm on twitter at jim sonis uh, we are also back tomorrow talking about some nba some nhl tom vecchio i'll also go through nascar in vegas formula one in bahrain to get you set for for this weekend make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread to get that and also check us out over on the FanDuel youtube page we'll talk to you all once again soon this has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network